Well, I think on the one hand, prayer is one of the most natural responses of humans. I read from Psalm 19 for the call to worship. It opens, uh, the heavens declare the glories of God. All men, I think, uh, through the ages have looked up in the heavens and seen evidence, recognized evidence of a creator. Paul, uh, when he was in Athens and ministering at the Areopagus, said he had made note of their religious nature, that he had seen their temples that were strewn through the city of Athens. But he noted on one that an inscription that was said that they pray to an unknown God. In times of crisis and terror, people pray. As we say, there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, while trying to find some recent survey findings on prayer, I came across this uh, last night in The Guardian, which is uh, one of London, England's main newspapers. It said, even amongst non-religious people, one in five pray regularly. One particular example was given of an agnostic man who prayed daily in spite of the fact that when he prayed he felt hypocritical for doing so. I think every person that has ever lived has at some point prayed in some sort of way. It is, in a way, natural. But on the other hand, prayer, at least the kind that God honors, seems most unnatural. The struggle Christians have to pray is universally attested to from the founding disciples and apostles through every century and through every heart. Our text today is one of the great passages on prayer in the Bible, and within, I think, we'll find some really great encouragement. It falls within a section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, pertaining to how the disciples were to practice their righteousness. How were they to practice their righteousness? You may have even seen this. He structured it with three different acts of righteousness. And what that means really is acts of piety or religious observance. He speaks of the practices of alms giving, the giving of money to the poor, of prayer and of fasting. Three of the chief acts of piety for Jews that Jesus wanted maintained. You may have noticed a warning that was consistent, the same for each of these practices, and it went something along these lines. Don't practice your piety before men in order to be seen by them. Now this may seem to contradict Jesus' own teaching from the very same sermon. Sermon on the Mount, if we turn to chapter 5, in verse 16, it says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works. You know, if you, tr if you contradict yourself as a preacher two or three weeks apart, probably you'll get away with it. But within the same sermon, it's a challenge. How do we reconcile what looks like a contradiction? Well, John Stott, I found very helpful on this. He writes, Jesus is speaking against, in these cases, different sins. On one hand, cowardice, and on the other hand, vanity. So it's our human cowardice which made him to say, let your light shine before men. And our human vanity which made him tell us to beware of practicing piety before men. Alexander Bruce sums it up well when he writes that we are to show when we're tempted to hide and hide when we're tempted to show. The goal is the same either way. The goal is the glory of God. We are to keep, why are we to keep our piety secret? It's in order that the glory may be given to God rather than to men. Why are we to let our light shine and do good works in the open? It is that men may glorify our Heavenly Father. Well, of these three acts, I'm going to focus on prayer this morning, and I'm really asking one question. What does godly prayer look like? What does godly prayer look like? We'll turn your eyes again to verses 5 and 6, <clears throat> and we'll start by noting that godly prayer is sincere. Godly prayer is sincere. 
And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, I want to be clear that this passage is not condemning public prayer in synagogues or churches, or even as needed, on the street corner. That's not the, the, that's not the import, the message of Jesus' warning. The warning is against that they may be seen by others. And so Jesus' concern is not about the place of our prayers, but the attitude behind our prayers. It doesn't condemn the prayer that can be seen, but the prayer prayed in order to be seen. And there's a vast difference between those two. So the contrast that Jesus presents is between a showy, hey, look at me, performance, and true sincerity. God, godly prayers are sincere prayers. A man who, whose eyes look left and right during devotions has not much devotion. Now, that said, prayer is, I think, fundamentally, intrinsically private, at least at its root. We come to God, firstly, as individuals, even though he places us and grows us within the family of God. We do come to him as individuals. We come to uh, a face-to-face -face reckoning with our God. That is the root of prayer. All our public expressions of the Christian faith, that would be our gathering for worship like this morning, gathering for the word, for prayer, for our good works, for our fellowship, all of that ought to be rooted in and fueled by our private devotion. That room word that is used by Jesus, that you go to your room, meant not only a private place, a set-apart place, but a place of God's storehouse. And storehouse was an interesting term. It was the place where the tithes of the people were brought to sustain the priesthood. But in this case, Jesus is using this in the sense of a spiritual storehouse. And so we go privately into that storehouse to receive the sustaining power and grace and provision of our Lord. Notice that all these expressions of piety or righteousness are expected devotions of the one who believes. When you give to the needy, verse 3. When you pray, verses 6 and 7. When you fast, verse 16. Not if you do, but when you do. So to be clear, the expectation of Jesus with respect to prayer is that we develop a habit of praying, and particularly of praying alone. Whether anyone sees it or not, in fact, better if they don't, pray every day. Pray for the rest of your days. And doing this in secret means no one else will know. But God does. And Jesus said that the Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is a mark of our sincerity that when we pray, we don't pray to be seen so that somebody else will recognize us. We don't pray, and this is the tension of this passage, for the rewards of men, the mere rewards of men. We want the rewards of God. And the primary reward of God is, of course, God himself, that we commune with God our creator, God. Quite likely, everything in you, and probably a lot that is outside of you, will fight against this tooth and nail every day of your life. It'll fight against this precious, sacred, secret time between you and the Lord. What are the different ways that we see a battle on this front? 
I've listed a few, but it'll probably just inspire you to think of perhaps your own as well. One, I think we don't feel we are good at prayer. We don't feel we're good at prayer, and that becomes a battleground for us. <clears throat> Busyness. How can I take the time to pray when I have so much to do? Some of us don't really believe God is listening to us or cares about us. Oh, he cares about lots of other people, but not me. I think also prayer is generally about stillness, <clears throat> to be still and know that he is God, quieting our hearts and minds before God. And this is not a typical practice for many of us in our society today, to be quiet, to be still. Our lives and our culture are so busy and so noisy that to be still can be rather uncomfortable to us if we're honest. It could be boring even, a time that is set apart for the Lord. <clears throat> we lack faith sometimes that anything happens, that our prayers mean anything. And it almost doesn't matter whether prayers are answered or not. If they're answered, we may believe, ah, oh, it probably would have happened anyway. If it doesn't get answered, then what was the use in praying? Unconfessed sin and broken relationship hinders our prayer with the Lord. But fundamentally, I think the, the one thread that we would find through all reasons, or all excuses, rather, or, or both, uh, would be that we have a, a high view of ourselves and a low view of God. I don't think if we have a proper view of who God is, that he is that one who provides for us a storehouse, a storehouse of blessing, a storehouse of provision, a storehouse of sustenance, a storehouse that sustains us through all of life, its highs and lows both, even its mundanity sometimes, like, not all of life is a high and low. There are lots of just boring, normal days. And he sustains us through all of that when we allow him to. If we actually did see him, this is the Lord who is the creator of all that is, the one who sustains, the one who empowers, the one that we ought to cherish. I don't think we can actually see him as he is if we struggle to come to him in prayer. Now, I said prayer is perhaps the most natural of human responses, and yet I think it's also the hardest habit to make natural. It really is. Many days you will not want to pray, but this is a habit that Jesus expects us to have, and it's a habit of infinite worth. Of my decades of being a Christian, I can honestly say that I have never spoken to somebody that I know has pressed into that presence of the Lord in, in regular prayer and regretted any moment they spent with the Lord. It's a habit that is of infinite worth and value. Now, I don't think the weight of this passage falls on prescription. By that I mean uh, that prayer must be in a certain time or place. Faithful, godly prayer can look different in your life than it does in mine, and I bet it does look different. But it must look like something. We are to have a habit of prayer. And if I was going to give you advice, this, and I am going to, <laughs> this is the best advice I can give you on prayer. Wait for it. Start small. So if you like all of us, struggle to pray either regularly or perhaps even at all. Start small. And by small, I mean ridiculously small. I mean so small, you cannot fail. How small? How about 10 seconds small? 30 seconds small? You pick the number that is so small, you will clear that bar. Start small. I can remember, I'm old enough to remember a time in the late 80s, I think it was, when I came across it anyway, when uh, there was a movement, Can You Not Tarry? 
and it encouraged people because of the garden scene uh, that we should be in prayer at least an hour a day. He said, Jesus said to his disciples, could you not tarry with me one hour? And of course people go with that with great enthusiasm because they either feel guilty about their prayer or they actually really, really want to press in more with the Lord. But you don't go from zero to 60. That any enthusiasm that was brought to that project wanes very quickly. Start small. Now, I know you're waiting for the other shoe to drop because you're thinking no pastor wants someone satisfied with 10 seconds of prayer a day. I don't have to say that, actually. Because if you truly spend, as a start, 10 seconds a day with your creator, sustainer, empowering God, if you come face to face with the God of the Bible, 10 seconds will not be enough. I spoke with someone after the first service and they said, yeah, I've gotten to the place where I miss it when I miss it. And I know what he means. I miss it when I miss my time with God. What do we get if we continue, uh, if we commit to communing with the true God of Scripture, when we commune with his infinite worth and beauty and power and wisdom, peace, then I guarantee you that communing time will uh, deepen and it will lengthen both. You will receive the greatest reward, and that is, of course, the gift of God himself. Secondly, godly prayer is simple. Godly prayer is simple, and uh, that's a good word. Look with me at verse 7. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. I think a lot of us struggle uh, when we feel we're not very good at prayer. And I think not just publicly, that's obvious if you're not confident in your prayer life, but even privately. Um, I know some people have said to me, I, I love the way Pastor Andrew prays. Um, now, he is good with words, he's a pastor, but that, that's not why his prayers are attractive to you. His prayers actually are infused with the Word of God. He spends time in God's Word and has learned how to pray in a, in a framework that honors God's Word. So I encourage you, if you want to improve in a way the way you feel about your prayer life, be more acquainted with God's Word and His will through the, through the scriptures. That being said, I think it's clear from this passage that we're not actually called to knock on the door of, of God's room, that room, that storehouse, with a perfectly eloquent, complicated, lengthy prayer. Godly prayer is simple. Jesus teaches us not to pray in order to be seen or impress others, we're to be sincere, now he tells us about sort of what to pray. Well, pagan prayers, pray, <laughs> pagan prayers at the time of Jesus aimed to manipulate the gods, the small g gods, with their many words. Some felt the quantity of their words mattered. You know, one of my children uh, hated writing essays, and so they loaded their writing with uh, wordy, empty phrases to fill up the word count. I can assure you, God does not have some bar of a prayer word count that you have to get to that threshold for him to accept your prayers. Others uh, of the pagans would invoke the names of numerous small g gods in the hope that one of them would pay attention and grant their requests. Or perhaps that same request would be made over and over and over and over again. So the picture we have from Jesus in his teaching is this big heap of words, word upon word upon word, piled high, but all of it amounting to nothing. It reminds me of the story in uh, 1 Kings 18 where the prophets of Baal were confronting the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel. The word records that they uh, cried out to Baal from morning until noon. Then besides their many, many words, they shouted and danced around their altar, even coming to the place of slashing and cutting themselves with swords and lances. 
Yet all that bluster, all that show was for nothing but silence. The word says, and as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. That's not our capital G, God. The God of Scripture hears every prayer. Now, perhaps you had a very distracted or even distant father, one who kept an eye and an ear on his business, his sport, his newspaper, while you wanted his attention. But God the Father hears every prayer. He's never too busy. He's never indifferent. He's never distant. We don't need the right formula or beautiful eloquence to capture his attention. You've already got it. Sometimes simple prayers are the best prayers. I remember the first time I was uh, praying in uh, a situation where someone, the leader, asked for one sentence prayers. It wasn't, you know, a, a, like a Sunday morning church gathering, uh, but it wasn't a small group size either. It was probably 20 to 25 of us, each of us very experienced, uh, long-standing Christians. And so that instruction to pray a one-sentence prayer was hard. But it was oh so powerful. We just heard simple, clear expressions of our adoration and our joy, our petitions, our thanksgivings. And then in so doing, we sort of collectively, of course, benefit from all of those simple, clear expressions. Sometimes we've done this as well in our prayer and praise nights. Uh, we need to get back to doing those from time to time. Uh, we'll say something simple like this. Um, add one word to this sentence. I adore you, Lord, because you are. And say one word. I adore you, Lord, because you are forgiving. I adore you, Lord, because of your mercy. I adore you, Lord, because of your steadfast love. Can you imagine, you know, you hear that, that, those one words that come from different parts of the room, different voices, and yet collectively we're all encouraged. Prayer can be simple. Godly prayers are simple. Take encouragement. We are called to simply pray, but we're called to pray simply. So please, this morning, reject this notion that your prayers must be good enough for God to be worthy of his attention. Faith-filled and faithful prayers are prayers that rely upon God's merciful generosity rather than our performance. Godly prayers, trusting prayer, because it roots its confidence in him and not in us, not in our prayer performance. Thirdly, godly prayer is sure. Godly prayer is sure. And I'm sorry, I couldn't resist the third alliterative S there. Um, godly prayer is sincere, simple, and sure. And by sure, I mean the kind of confidence I just spoke of. Verse 8 says, you can turn to that. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is not meant to undermine our prayers. Like one may say, if, if God already knows what I need, like, why do I ask? What's the use of prayer? The intent is not to mitigate against our desire to pray. It's to fuel it. It's to fuel our confidence, to ground our confidence in the one who knows us, who really knows us and knows our needs. Because we can't tell God something he doesn't know. That's encouraging. You don't have to have something so novel or captivating or faith-filled even to capture his attention. Oh, that's a good request. I'm going to give my attention to that this morning. We can't tell God something he doesn't already know. So our goal is not to amaze him with insight or convince him he needs to hear us. It is to commune with the one who already 
knows us. He already knows you this morning. He knows our every need. The God who already knows and cares even before we ask. That is our God. And yet he still wants us to ask. Every parent knows this. We still want our children to ask. The Father wants us to ask, and he longs for us to commune. And it's in that communion that we grow to know the Father. Uh, Daniel, my, my youngest, uh, I gave this example to our, our life group a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's good. It's a good picture of faith. Um, this is when he was a really young lad, like probably four or five years old, and we were in a church that received regular offerings. Like every service, there was an offering, and you'd go to the front. And so I just turned to him one uh, day and asked, Daniel, do you have an offering? And he said, yes. And simultaneously, as he says yes, he held out his hand. And honestly, there was, he was not being cheeky, mischievous. There wasn't a sense of entitlement. Yeah, I've got one if you've got it. Nothing like that. Have you got an offering? Yes. Because he knew his father would provide that which he needed. That's faith. When we grow in communion and know our Father God, that we know his desires for us, that our desires do become his desires. And it's easy to pray in faith when we know we have not only the ear of God, but the heart of God. Now, James does warn us that uh, we have not, either because we ask not or because we ask amiss. This asking amiss means that we can pray sometimes stumbly, bumbly, bad prayers. Poorly conceived, they, they could have bad theology, they're misguided for any number of reasons. And yet, he still encourages us to pray. The Apostle Paul gives us great encouragement in Romans 8. The Godhead itself, himself, the Spirit intercedes for us. When we know not how we ought to pray, when we pray those bumbly, stumbly prayers, the Spirit is working to perfect those prayers when our heart is for him, to honor him, to be contrite before him. We're encouraged to pray. The Spirit works upon us to, prefer, to perfect those imperfect prayers. Think about it. Just as God, we expect God, I trust you do this morning anyway, to patiently forgive and mend our failings, surely for the contrite heart, he forgives and mends our imperfect prayers as well. Is that not the gospel that we believe and trust and rely upon this morning? So, godly prayer is sincere, it's simple, and it's sure. Now, what do we pray about? Well, anything and everything. Paul to the Philippians said, do not be anxious about anything. Why? Well, because in everything, you're going to, by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And he continues that in so doing, he will guard your heart and mind in Christ. What a great promise. So whatever is on your mind, tell him about it. Just speak to him about it. Now, this doesn't mean that godly prayer has no boundaries, that we can make it to be whatever uh, we want it to be and to whomever we want it to be. No, we can pray about whatever is on our heart and mind. But Jesus does teach us in this passage, I think, a very helpful structure from which we can build faithful prayers. And the Lord's Prayer, as we call it, serves as a model for us, not merely to recite by rote. It's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But that's, that wasn't the intention. It was to provide a model for us how, what are we to value? What are we to pray for on this earth? It tells us that we are to pray for his kingdom, but also the world that we live within. It tells us to pray for our needs, but also the needs of others. It tells us that we pray for forgiveness, but also the strength to forgive. We pray for deliverance from temptations and evil. Did you know the prayer begins with God and ends with the devil. And in between covers all the petitions that are pertinent to life. We pray about anything and everything. Now note that we go to God with our prayer, 
and we go to him as our Father in heaven. And what a beautiful juxtaposition that is. You can't get something more familial than Father. We go to him as Father. We're his children. Again, we, we are then accepted not on the basis of performance or earning something, or earning some status that we can be granted access. We go because he is Father. And yet he is also the Father who is in heaven. A reminder that this Father is also our sovereign Lord and Creator. This Father welcomes us, but we pray in confidence because the one who is near us is also the one who is enthroned in heaven. And so today, I want to encourage you, pray sincerely, pray simply, and pray surely.